These are the wrap-up slides on our fourth class, which was on network industries. So I think of this class as being about the regulation of natural monopoly. Um, and so uh, as we think about that, we should have a conception of the circumstances under which we're likely to see uh, only one of something or only a handful of something. Uh, obviously, we have a conception of situations where we see lots of things, restaurants maybe. But when do we see natural monopoly? Uh, and what are the consequences of that? That's ultimately driven by uh, is, uh, the shape of the underlying cost function. And I went through an example in class in which we had a very simple cost function, one where you know we've got fixed costs and then a and, and then a flat marginal cost. Um, and if if that's our cost function, then having a single facility do all of the production turns out to be the cheapest way to do any level of production. As soon as we have more than one facility, uh, we've effectively spent those fixed startup costs a second time, uh, and we're not buying anything, uh, in, in, in the model at least, with regard, to the, with regard to the production opportunities. But that's not to say that having that cost function available means that we will inevitably lead to having a single firm in the industry. Uh, and a lot of that depends on how a potential entrant facing the incumbent thinks the subsequent competition game that they would be playing would play out. We went through a couple of examples where um, the entrant would stay out, we thought, because of what that game would look like, either because the incumbent had made it clear that they were committed to pushing costs down to marginal cost, how you make that commitment is more complicated, or because they thought that they would then play a, a price competition game, a Bertrand game, uh, where the Nash equilibrium would be in prices, and prices would go to marginal costs, and therefore you couldn't recover the fixed investment, and therefore don't enter. That said, you know the Corneau version of that model looks different, um, and in that situation we might sustain uh, multiple firms in the industry, and therefore uh, a natural monopoly cost function wouldn't necessarily mean we'd only have one firm in the industry. Also talked about natural monopoly pricing issues, um, where um, we, we've got, as it were, a conundrum. On the one hand, to the extent that we're recovering fixed cost um, through sales of the good, uh, then we've got prices, average, we've got prices which are above marginal cost. Um, and um, that means that we're missing sales that we could be making. Uh, given the fact that we might have someone who values it less than the price, less than the average cost, um, but who values it for more than the marginal cost. Uh, that's a loss in welfare. At the same time, of course, if we price at marginal cost, then we don't cover the fixed cost, and we've got insolvent firms. So figuring out how to navigate that is part of what we do with regard to pricing in these industries. And I talk about two ideas there. So one idea is the Ramsey pricing idea, which says, okay, what you ought to do is maximize social welfare, uh, subject to a solvency constraint, and the central inside of Ramsey pricing is, is that you want to try to recover his model taxes and tax revenues, but in, in the uh, public utility world, a uh, fixed cost, you want to try to recover those from inelastic demanders. Social loss emerges from people changing their behavior in response to prices. If they don't change their behavior, then there's not as much social loss. So recover fixed costs from inelastic demanders, don't recover them from elastic demanders. As I talked about in class, that's not obviously politically sustainable. From a taxation standpoint, that means you want to tax things like food and medicine, um, and um, that's not necessarily where we go. The alternative to that, and, and the reality is, is these probably in concept work together, is to engage in multiple part pricing. Don't think of the recovering the fixed costs through sales of the good, but, but, but split it up and create an access charge, uh, and then maybe you can do marginal cost pricing. And I offered Costco as an example of that, though if you look at your utility bills, you see a, see a lot of multi-part pricing there. We then talked about terminal railroad, and the point of the terminal railroad case was to sort of frame the discussion for the day, which is about non-discrimination and access. Uh, and so... Uh, Terminal Railroad is obviously an early 20th century antitrust case uh, where, where Jay Gould unites uh, these three facilities for crossing the Mississippi River at St. Louis. Uh, and and the, the, the testimony in the case suggests that 
that operating those facilities as a single facility uh, from a standpoint of just the mechanics, the technology of, of having it work together, that that might have been the right thing to do, or a kind of natural monopoly. That's the testimony of Perkins, the engineer. Um, but at the same time, the court's very concerned about, about the access rules, um, and so uh, creates a kind of access obligation and a kind of non-discrimination obligation uh, with regard to this, with, with this shared facility. Now, as we talked about in class, you know, you need to think about what kind of regulatory obligations, regulatory burdens you're undertaking there um, in, in the particular situation in the case. Um, the, the group inside, as it were, the number of railroads involved in the terminal facilities had expanded voluntarily over time, um, such that a majority of the railroads using facilities in St. Louis were actually part of the internal group, and it's not obvious that had you simply expanded to everyone, um, that that would have given the outsiders a more decision power inside, since they would have just routinely gotten outvoted. That's not what the court focuses on. Spent some time talking about rate of return regulation. Um, uh, the problem for, for investors there is, is that because these industries are seen as natural monopoly industries, uh, where um, there could be a routine exercise of monopoly power. We're going to see a lot of rate regulation and historically have. Uh, and as soon as you have that kind of rate regulation, uh, then you've got the possibility that um, you will have made investment decisions and now face a, you know, prices, regulated prices, which are in some sense too low to compensate you for the investments you've made or the risk you've undertaken. And the particular problem with these assets is, is it's just not easy to shift these assets to a, a different industry. Uh, some stores or, you know, if all of a sudden they outlawed bakeries, we'd switch them to some other sort of property. Um, but uh, that's not true of the kinds of assets in, in these industries. The flip side of that is, is that, you know, if you're the government and thinking about how you induce investment in these industries, um, you know, what is your mechanism for committing to meaningful returns um, you know, given the natural expropriation incentives after the investments have been made. And so that's the complication for the government. I talked through sort of a standard rate of return framework, uh, and that is, is um, in many ways quite open-ended. Um, and so we should think of, of, of these as being sort of a broad delegation to the, to the you know, typically the Public Utility Commission implementing the framework. Uh, as soon as you're invoking words like fair and reasonableness, and that's what you tend to see in these situations, you've really given the, the commissions an enormous amount of authority uh, with regard to, to rate setting in these situations. The modern access approach has, has tended to move somewhat away from, from regulation of final market prices to creating a market in inputs and then regulates those prices. So the 96 Telecommunications Act uh, it takes the local telephone network and tries to figure out what are the natural monopoly components and what are the components where we might see competition and to make sure that potential competitors can gain access to the natural monopoly components at, at reasonable prices. Now those prices, according to the incumbents, have been extremely low uh, and so there's been a history of litigation really from the get-go. Um, and at the end of the day, that approach, I think, has turned out to be um, complicated and, and not so important in the sense that the actual competition that has merged has been a kind of change in technology, wireless telecommunications and telephone over cable and the like. Um, that, that's what we've seen there. We've also seen and are in the midst of an era of non-discrimination regulation. Um, and so the kinds of issues we saw in Terminal Railroad we're seeing played out again today. Uh, and we had a discussion about network neutrality um, uh, and, you know, a hypothetical of Comcast blocking Netflix. What the rules look to is they contemplate that it may be perfectly sensible to have quality of service discrimination, our discussion about maybe uh, email can, can get a different quality of service than, than, than video, um, but not allowing discrimination based upon ownership source. We had a discussion about, you know, to what extent we think those ideas should apply to something like Twitter uh, and the Twitter API, where Twitter had a very open API and has slowly closed that over time in ways that the firms that have 
you know, built businesses based upon the Twitter API find um, uh, unreasonable. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's unlikely that we are going to regulate, <laughs> inconceivable that we're going to regulate, um, you know, all of the startups that we see. Um, we're likely to impose greater regulations as a firm achieves some level of dominance. Then we switch to standard setting. So um, the modern networks are these virtual networks organized around standards, and we saw an example of that in the DVD business review letters that we read. Uh, the history of, of media, plastic media for distributing content is. We see only a handful of those in place at a particular point in time. Uh, and we recognize that the design of a standard uh, can create ex post market power for, for the patents, and there are often many patents involved in these. Uh, and we try to control that up front uh, through some sort of commitments. Um, and, and those commitments are often articulated in frameworks that are pretty general. So the fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory, or reasonable and non discriminatory commitments um, are, 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 are open. Um, and um, the DOJ and the smartphone closing letter that we looked at made clear, I think makes clear, uh, that the openness of those commitments and the vagueness of those commitments creates ways in which um, access can be limited, in which discrimination can occur, and they seem to be nervous about that uh, with regard to, partic in particular, Google, but yet notwithstanding that they approved the Motorola Mobility deal. Though, again, as we noted in class, at least the press is reporting uh, that the FTC is investigating Google with regard to these FRAND, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory patent obligations with regard to be standards essential of patents um, right now, and that there may be a settlement on the potential settlement on the table. Okay, that's what we did in Class 4 on network industries.